in a hurry, I said. Yes, he said. But first, the price. This is the best camera in Darpur, and I'm the best photographer. Three photographs will cost you two pounds fifty. Two pounds fifty? And I laughed. Two pounds fifty, and pay me now, please, the photographer answered. I did not know the price of photographs. What could I do? Then the photographer said, You're an old man. For you, the price is two pounds. So I gave him the money, and he took the photographs. Come back tomorrow morning, he said. I want my three photographs now, immediately, I said. Don't be stupid, the photographer said. Photographs take twenty-four hours. Come back tomorrow. What could I do? So I said, yes, tomorrow morning. Good, said the photographer. Now go, I have a lot of work. I'm very busy. I went back to the bus station. I sat on the bus for three hours. I walked ten miles back to my village. It was night time, and I was very tired. Martha and my friends were waiting for me. Where is the money? Martha asked. I have no money. I cannot change the money order. First I must have an identity card. And I told Martha everything. Tomorrow I am going to Darpur again, I said. Then I did not talk again. I was very tired, and it was late at night. I lay on my bed, and I slept. I woke up late the next morning. The sun was already high. I did not walk to the main road and catch a bus. All the buses go to Darpur early in the morning. So I stayed at home on Wednesday. I was still very tired. I rested and talked to the villagers about the money order. I told them about the identity card and the photographer. The school teacher said, Yes, the official is correct. In a post office, you always show your identity card. The school teacher filled in my application form for an identity card. Application form for identity card. Name, Adam Jamai. Address, Village of Minta. Age, 72 years. Place of birth, Village of Minta. Occupation, farmer. Color of eyes, brown. On Thursday, I traveled to Darpur again. I walked to the main road, and I caught a bus. In Darpur, I walked to the house of the photographer. I knocked on the door of the house. No one came to the door. I knocked again loudly with my stick. A woman opened the door. Who are you? What do you want? she asked. Can I have my photographs, please? I said. Your photographs? I have no photographs, the woman replied. I came here on Tuesday. Where is the photographer? I asked. He's out. He's not here. And the woman closed the door. I shouted at her. I'm waiting here for him. After a long time, the photographer came back. He looked tired, and he smelt of beer. Give me my photographs, I said. I have waited a long time for you. The photographer looked at me and said, I don't know you, old man. What photographs are you talking about? My three photographs for my identity card. I paid you two pounds for them on Tuesday. Give me my photographs immediately, or my money. Your photographs? Your money? What are you talking about? The photographer said. Show me the paper. Show me the receipt for your money. My receipt? I asked. Yes, where is your receipt? The photographer asked. 
You didn't give me a receipt, I shouted. Give me my photographs or my money immediately. And I hit the photographer hard with my stick. I am old, but I am still strong. The photographer fell on the ground. He shouted, help, help, this old man is killing me. And I hit him hard again. Lots of people ran out of their houses. I hit the photographer again, and two men held me. I could not get away from the two men. The photographer was very angry, and I was very angry. Lots of people were shouting. Then a policeman came. The photographer shouted to the policeman, This old man hit me three times with his stick. He's a thief and a murderer. He wants my money. The policeman held my arm and said, Come with me to the police station. I did not say anything. We walked to the police station. At the police station, the policeman asked me, Did you hit that man three times? Yes, I said. He didn't give me my photographs. Show me your identity card, said the policeman. I am Adam of Minter Village, I replied, and I haven't got an identity card. Old man, said the policeman, go back to your village. Don't come here and fight. Keep out of Darpur. And he pushed me into the street. I went back to my village. I was tired and angry. Next day I told my story to all the villagers. The villagers were angry. Martha was very unhappy. She said, Saul is working very hard. He is sending money and we can't have the money. What are we going to do? I did not know. Then in the evening the school teacher came to my house again. Adam, perhaps I can help you, the school teacher said. Here is a letter to Mr. Sheth. Mr. Sheth, I said, who is he? He's an important man in Darpur, and he's a friend of my wife's cousin, replied the schoolteacher. This letter is to Mr. Sheth. The letter is about your money order. Perhaps he can help you. I took the letter and thanked the schoolteacher. So I travelled to Darpur again on Saturday for the third time. After a long time, I found Mr. Sheth's house. The door was opened by a tall man. Can I see Mr. Sheth? I asked. And who are you? The tall man asked. I have a letter for Mr. Sheth, I replied. I see. Can I have the letter, please? And the tall man held out his hand. The letter is here, I said. And I took the letter out of my pocket. But I must see Mr. Sheth. Many people want to see Mr. Sheth, the tall man told me. He is a very busy man and a very important man. Mr. Sheth is not here at the moment, but give me your letter and Mr. Sheth will read it later. I gave the tall man the letter. Then I waited. Later a large black car came and a man went into the house. A long time later... The tall man opened the door again. Come in now, please, and follow me, he said. I followed the tall man. We went into a large room with fine carpets and big chairs. Another man was in the room. He was drinking. This is Mr. Sheth, said the tall man. I am Adam of Minter Village, I replied. Yes, I know, said Mr. Sheth. Thank you for the letter. I hope I can help you. I like to help people. Please, sit down. Mr. Sheth smiled. His clothes were new and smart. Thank you, I said. Can I see the money order, please? Mr. Sheth asked. I took the money order out of my pocket. 
By now, the money order was dirty and looked very old. I gave it to Mr. Sheth. This money order is for one hundred pounds, I said. My son sent it from a foreign country. Mr. Sheth unfolded the money order and looked at it. You can't change this money order, he said. This money order is not worth one hundred pounds. But this money order is worth nothing. Worth nothing? Worthless? I asked. Then Mr. Sheth looked at the money order again. Yes, worthless. Your son does not understand about money orders. This money order is not correct for our country, Mr. Sheth said. Then he looked at the money order again and said, And this money order is also old. It is out of date. I said nothing. Mr. Sheth gave me the money order back. Then Mr. Sheth smiled and said, I am very sorry. You are an old man. You came a long way from your village. What can I give you to eat and drink? I was not hungry. But Mr. Sheth went out of the room. Then he brought me some coffee and some cakes. I drank my coffee. Old man, said Mr. Sheth, I like to help people. I am a rich man. Give me your money order. I gave my money order to Mr. Sheth. Yes, this money order is worthless, he said. Viborg is a city in Denmark. It is an old city, but it has only a few old buildings. A great fire destroyed most of the old town in 1726. Mr. Anderson was writing a book on the history of Denmark. He went to Viborg in 1891. He wanted to study the history of the town. He stayed in an old building in Viborg, the Golden Lion Inn. The inn was nearly 350 years old. Anderson asked the landlord for a large room. The landlord of the Golden Lion showed him two rooms, room number 12 and room number 14. There were three large windows in each room. The windows looked onto the street. Anderson chose room number 12. In the evening, Anderson went downstairs for supper. He saw a blackboard. The names of all the guests were written on the blackboard. Anderson saw that the inn was full. There were no empty rooms. Anderson noticed that there was no room number 13. 13 is an unlucky number. Many people do not want to stay in a room with an unlucky number. When Anderson went upstairs to bed, he tried to unlock his door. It did not open. Then he saw that he had made a mistake. It was the wrong room. The number on the door was number 13. He heard someone moving inside the room. I'm very sorry, he said, and went to the door of room number 12. Perhaps the servants sleep in room 13, Anderson thought. He decided to ask the landlord about it the next day. Anderson lit the oil lamp and looked round. Room number 12 looked smaller by lamplight. Anderson was tired. He went to bed. In the morning, Anderson went to the town hall. He wanted to study the town records. Anderson read many very old papers. The oldest records were from the 16th century. There were some letters from the Bishop of Viborg dated 1560. The bishop had owned three or four houses in the city. He had rented a house to a man called Nicholas Franken. The townspeople of Viborg did not like Nicholas Franken. Some people wrote to the bishop to say that Franken was a bad man. They said that Franken was a magician. They wanted Franken to leave the city. The bishop said that Nicholas Franken had done nothing wrong. He did not believe that Franken was a magician. It was time for the town hall to close. As Anderson was leaving, the town clerk spoke to him. I see you are reading about the bishop and Nicholas Franken, the clerk said. I am interested in them, but I do not know where Franken lived. 
Many of the town records were burnt in the Great Fire of 1726. Anderson thanked the clerk and went back to the Golden Lion. He wanted to ask the landlord about room number 13, but the landlord was busy. Anderson went upstairs and stopped outside the door of number 13. He heard someone inside the room. The person was walking around and talking in a strange voice. Anderson went to his own room. He decided that number 12 was too small. He decided to ask the landlord for a large room. Also, he was angry because his suitcase was missing. It had been on a table beside the wall. Both the table and the suitcase had disappeared. Perhaps the landlord had moved the suitcase to a storeroom. Anderson wanted it back. It was too late to call the landlord. Anderson went to the window and lit a cigarette. He looked out of the window. There was a tall house on the opposite side of the street. The lamp was behind him. He saw his shadow on the wall of the house opposite. The person in room 13 was also standing at the window. Anderson saw a second shadow on the wall of the house opposite. This second shadow was strange. The person in room 13 was wearing a tall, pointed hat. Also, the light from room 13 was red. The light was the colour of blood. Anderson opened the window and put his head outside. He tried to see the person in the next room. He saw the sleeve of a long white coat. That was all. The person in room 13 suddenly moved away from the window. The red light went out. Anderson finished his cigarette. He left the ashtray on the window ledge. Then he turned out the lamp and went to bed. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Next morning, the maid brought hot water to the room. Anderson woke up and remembered his suitcase. Where is my suitcase, please? he asked. The maid laughed and pointed. The suitcase was on the table beside the wall. It was exactly where Anderson had left it. He noticed another strange thing. His ashtray was on the middle window ledge. He clearly remembered smoking his cigarette by the end window, next to number 13. He finished dressing and decided to visit his neighbour in room 13. He was surprised when he went to the door of the next room. The next room was number 14. Anderson was frightened. Was he going mad? After breakfast, he went to the town hall and read more of the old papers. He found only one more letter from the bishop about Nicholas Franken. A group of townspeople had tried to make Franken leave Viborg. They had gone to Franken's house, but Franken had disappeared. The bishop wrote that no one knew where Franken had gone. That was the end of the matter. That evening, Anderson spoke to the landlord of the Golden Lion Inn. Why is there no room 13 in the inn? he asked. Many people won't sleep in a room number 13, the landlord replied. They say it's unlucky. Then who is in your room number 13? asked Anderson. There isn't a room number 13, the landlord said. Your room is next to room number 14. Of course, said Anderson. I must have made a mistake. Would you like to come up to number 12 for a glass of brandy and a cigar? Ah, I'd like to very much, said the landlord. They went upstairs together. They went past room number 10 and room number 11 to reach number 12. The landlord looked at the inside of number 12. This room looks very small, he said. Anderson poured two glasses of brandy. Both men lit cigars. Anderson opened the window to let out the smoke. There was a red light and a shadow on the wall of the house opposite. The light came from number 13. The shadow was dancing wildly, but there was no noise. Anderson sat down to drink his brandy. He wanted to tell the landlord about the strange things he had seen. Suddenly, a terrible noise came from the next room. Is that a cat? 
asked Anderson. Or is there a madman in the room next door? It's Mr. Jensen, said the landlord. He often stays in the room 14. The poor man must be ill. A loud knock sounded on the door of Anderson's room. Suddenly a man opened the door and came in. Please stop that terrible noise, the man said. Mr. Jensen, the landlord said. We thought you were making the noise. The three men looked at each other for a moment. Then they went out quickly into the corridor. The noise was coming from the door of room number 13. The landlord banged on the door and turned the handle. The door was locked. I'll bring men to break the door down, the landlord shouted and ran down the stairs. Jensen and Anderson stood outside number 13. The noise inside the room became louder and wilder. I want to tell you something strange, Jensen said to Anderson. My room has three windows in the day and only two at night. Perhaps you think I am mad. Good Lord, my room is the same, said Anderson. My room looks smaller at night than during the day. The door of number 13 opened suddenly, and an arm came out. The arm was thin and covered in grey hairs. The fingernails were long and dirty. Anderson shouted and pulled Jensen away from the door. The arm disappeared and the door closed. The sound of mad laughter came from number 13. <laughs> The landlord brought two men up the stairs. The men had axes in their hands. They swung their axes against the door of number 13. Suddenly, the men cried out and dropped their axes. They had hit a wall. The door of number 13 had disappeared. In the morning, workmen pulled up the floor between rooms 12 and 14. Under the floor, they found a box. There were old papers inside the box. Anderson thought that the papers belonged to Nicholas Franken, the man who had disappeared in 1560. No one was able to read the writing on the papers. It was in a strange language. The writing was brown. The ink looked old. But Anderson did not think it was ink. He thought the papers were written in blood. <laughs> the picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want.